day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Data Monitoring Committees for Today and Tomorrow. My name is Andrew Jordan and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speaker. Now this webinar is designed to be interactive so please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speaker throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen and if you require any assistance please contact me at any time by sending a message using that chat panel. And at this time all participants are in a listen only mode and the presentation slides will advance automatically for you. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. And at this point, I would like to thank IDDI who helped develop the content for this presentation. International Drug Development Institute is an expert center in biostatistical and integrated e-clinical services for pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies in several disease areas including oncology and ophthalmology. IDDI optimizes the clinical development of drugs, biologics, and devices thanks to proven statistical expertise and operational excellence. Founded in 1991, IDDI has offices in Belgium, Boston, Raleigh, North Carolina, and San Francisco, California. And now, I would like to introduce our speaker for today's event, Dr. Jay Herson is a Senior Associate of Biostatistics at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, and is a collaborator of IDDI. He'll, he'll be drawing on his 25 years of experience with data monitoring committees in the pharmaceutical industry, which led to his book, Data and Safety Monitoring Committees in Clinical Trials, published by Chapman and Hall, CRC, in 2009. And now, without further ado, I would like to hand the mic over to Dr. Jay Herson. You can begin your presentation when ready. Okay. okay. Um, well, hello everybody and uh, thank you uh, for joining uh, today. I am most pleased to be speaking to the IDDI and XTalk uh, nations. Uh, and I do want, I, we have a lot of material to cover and I, I, I don't want to rush, but I do want to get to your questions uh, at the end. So what are uh, the DMC's responsibilities? Uh, patient protection, especially for safety, to have an objective uh, a panel uh, independent of the sponsor, and that word independent is very important, to be reviewing the ongoing uh, safety data. Uh, stewardship is an important word. Stewardship means the ultimate uh, responsibility, the fiducial responsibility, and whenever we ask should the DMC do this or shouldn't we do this? Uh, the question is, is this stewardship or is it not? Um, and you might think of a corporation. The sponsor is the officer of the corporation and the DMC is the board of directors of the corporation, uh, meaning the DMC has the ultimate fiducial responsibility in a corporation, the board of directors the fiducial responsibility to the shareholders, the DMC in a clinical trial the fiducial responsibility to the patients. Uh, and independence, as I say, is very important. There will be many challenges uh, to independence. And uh, we will have uh, some questions about that as we go through. Now, we do not do adjudication on DMCs, although we may have at one time. We do, DMCs do not typically do adjudication of efficacy endpoints. That's usually done by a separate uh, committee. However, I will go now to the first DMC that we know of in the pharma industry. I uh, was privileged to be the chair of that DMC. It was in 1988. A company at the time was called Smith Klein in French, 
and they were uh, in a clinical trial for cimetidine uh, for stress ulcers. Uh, cimetidine is known as Tagamet, uh, at least in North America. Uh, but this was an IV form uh, for patients coming into an emergency room with stress ulcers. It was a placebo-controlled trial. And uh, the efficacy endpoint was the prevention of upper GI bleeding. So the DMC certainly had safety and efficacy responsibilities, but, the, but they were doing adjudication in this trial because uh, the question of did the patient bleed or not, uh, uh, there were, the patients were intubated and there were different uh, types of evidence of bleeding. Uh, some tubes had to be removed earlier than uh, uh, Smith-Klein would have liked. And some independent panel had to decide, did the patient bleed or, or not, a blinded uh, panel. Uh, and that's what uh, we were. But we also reviewed the safety data. Um, so what has been established then uh, in 26 years? Um, there should be a charter for the DMC. There should be no conflict of interest. There should be open and closed sessions. There should be a masking or a blinding policy for the committee. And somebody should keep the minutes. Well, uh, that isn't a whole lot. Uh, so the motivation uh, today and in my book is it is time to consider what are the best practices for a DFC. Uh, industry trials are different from government-sponsored clinical trials in ways that many of you are probably aware. And uh, uh, there were books before and discussions before at meetings, but many of them dealt with the government-sponsored uh, trial DMCs. No issues are strictly clinical or strictly statistical. All issues are scientific, is what we have learned. And unlike the final efficacy analysis, no decisions on safety are made strictly on the basis of statistics. Uh, so, uh, although we are looking at st the statistical analysis of safety data, uh, we make decisions on safety in other ways. Uh, so, my book was published in March of 2009, and we're going to go through some of the highlights of that book uh, today. Uh, so, the overview is, uh, the talk, my emphasis of my talk is on safety data, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, we'll have an introduction. We'll talk about safety monitoring, statistical methods, biases and pitfalls, DMC decisions, and emerging issues. Now, why safety data? Why, why am I putting the emphasis on safety data? Well, efficacy is considered only at specific times in a clinical trial and perhaps only at the end of the trial when the DMC is no longer involved. 85% of the data collected in a clinical trial are for safety, and 90% of the DMC operations are safety-oriented even when the DMC has efficacy responsibilities, such as in a planned interim analysis. Safety data are more subjective than efficacy data, and safety decisions are made in the absence of knowledge of efficacy, making risk-benefit thinking difficult. So there is a, there is a lot of art to uh, safety monitoring as well as science. Now, it is very important to consider this pharma industry demographics. The annual, I, I'm dividing, as you can see, between big pharma, middle pharma and infant pharma companies. Now, um, again, uh, the, this annual revenue thing is very arbitrary, but I think we all know who is big pharma, middle pharma, and uh, infant pharma. Uh, but, uh, you know, big pharma has many products on the market, middle pharma some, infant pharma none. Uh, the, uh, the, the larger companies are already public, the infant pharma may be public or there's venture capital financing. Uh, and uh, the infant pharma has to show progress on this one product they have in this clinical trial to increase financing, to create licensing opportunities. Lots of pressure on infant pharma is what I'm trying to say. 
um, and uh, the, the vulnerability to negative trial information is considerable for an infant pharma company. And as far as DMC uh, procedures are concerned, the larger companies already have them in place, and they have SOPs already for that. The infant pharma, not well uh, developed and often created as a trial develops. In fact, those of us who are serving on the DMC often have to educate the sponsor staff on what the procedures should be because they don't have it in place already. And you can see how this has an impact on the DMC operations. So who are the members of the safety monitoring team? Well, the sponsor, of course, the data monitoring committee, uh, the data analysis center. Now, these are the people, usually a CRO, these are the people who are going to prepare the reports uh, for the, uh, the DMC to review at, uh, at their meeting. And there is the IRB or the Ethics Committee. They're, they aren't involved in the DMC meetings, but certainly they're part of the, the safety monitoring team. And the pharmacovigilance unit of the sponsor, sometimes this is called the medical governance uh, unit. Um, these are people, I, some people think that we on um, a DMC, as soon as we see a, a serious safety signal, we say, okay, this trial is terminated. That is not true. We have to report to someone at the sponsor, connected with the sponsor, who are firewalled uh, from them, uh, who are, are people who are reviewing safety data regularly, talk to them and say, look, uh, we may terminate this trial. What do you think we should do? And usually these people are very helpful in getting uh, more information for us uh, before we make a final decision without telling the protocol staff at the sponsor about this. Now, in infant pharma, there is no such unit. And so we have to make sure that they appoint a person or a group of people, usually at another CRO, a drug development people who we could report to uh, when something like this happens. Now, who are the DMC members? Generally, two physicians and a biostatistician. Now, one physician may be an adverse event, that's AE expert. Uh, for instance, a cardiologist in an oncology trial, because they may be expecting cardiology, cardiovascular adverse events. Sometimes there will be two oncologists and a biostatistician, and a fourth person would be uh, the cardiologist as a re regular member. Now, we can always have ad hoc consultants, an allergist, a hematologist, they're not, they don't attend the meetings, but they are available for consultation. Um, a, no, uh, and then a non-voting independent statistician from the DAC. So that person from the Data Analysis Center, that person is a statistician. They don't vote, but they are there to do unmasking, to get us further data and uh, stuff like that. And they attend every meeting. Uh, so um, we have um, an orientation uh, uh, meeting and then periodic safety data review meetings as the trial progresses. So I have some numbers here in the next bullet that are in green because they're just arbitrary numbers, but we would say, the, as an example, the first safety review meeting after 50 patients complete one cycle of therapy or four months, whichever comes first. Now, the reason for the four months, whichever comes first, is if accrual is slow uh, and the 50 patients completing one cycle take eight months instead of six months or four months, whatever they had expected it to be, um, we don't want any more time to go by because, indeed, uh, patients may be experiencing uh, some serious adverse events. So that is the usual uh, way we handle that. Um, and um, the, um, at the orientation meeting, I won't read every item on this list that you see, 
But these are the things we have to do. Obviously, we have to uh, decide who is the chair. And the SAE data flow, the serious adverse event uh, data flow, who will get it? How soon do they get it? Does just the chairperson get it? And then decide what to do with it. Is it done in real time, et cetera? Who will prepare the minutes? Um, uh, and any modifications to the protocol that, uh, that uh, there are uh, the case report forms or informed consent that the DMC members want. Um, uh, suggestion on the format of the tables and listings, uh, preferences. Uh, this is a time where someone on the DMC might say, I want uh, echocardiography and I want that to be added. I want a, a certain um, uh, depression scale uh, to be added uh, to this protocol, things like that. Um, the uh, plans for the quality control of the data, software validation, uh, will the DMC review publications, the package insert, integrated summary of safety? Usually they don't, but this should be decided now. Uh, and what are the, is the budget for the DMC? And what is the schedule for the first D, uh, data review meeting? Now I'm going to be giving, uh, showing you these questions from time to time. They come from my book. All of these questions are things that actually happened that either I experienced or someone reported to me. It gives you an idea of what really happens at DMC meetings. Here's a question. I am the biostatistical member of a DMC working on a trial for an infant uh, pharma sponsor. We've been appalled by the extremely poor quality of, uh, of the data that we are receiving. Uh, the sponsor's CRO is performing poorly in monitoring. Uh, patient narratives are not arriving in a timely manner. AE forms are incomplete. And we're even concerned that the treatment group assignments may not be correct. The DMC morale is low. Believe me, it is low in a case like this. Can we all just resign uh, from this mess? Um, well, what, what do you think? We now have quick poll uh, number one, and Andrew is going to poll you and report uh, the results. That's right. Well, thank you for that. We certainly do have that poll question on the screens of audience members right now. What do you think? Can we all just resign from this mess? Your options are yes, resign today, no, cannot resign, or your third option there, resign as a last resort. And you can click on your screen to uh, pick on any of those answers that you'd like. All right, can we all just resign from this mess? Looks like most of you have voted at this point, so I'm going to be closing polling now and sharing the results with everyone. And there we have it, 47% of you said resign as last resort. Another 47% said no, cannot resign. And 7% of you said yes, resign today. And with that, Dr. Herson, I'll send the mic back to you. Yeah, uh, these are very good answers, and they, uh, they do show uh, the usual spread uh, that we have. Um, the, the issue is this. Once, uh, remember the word stewardship now. Uh, once uh, a trial begins, uh, resignation as a last resort is, is, is what is preferable because if from this company, this infant pharma company that is doing a lousy job of running this trial and, and their CRO, um, we, uh, if you resign, who is going to be around for uh, patient protection? Will they, uh, will they get substitutes for you? Will they do it promptly? And who would uh, join a, a DMC when they hear that other uh, members, distinguished people, have already uh, resigned? Uh, now, you can always resign before a trial begins, that is, decide not to participate, uh, but not once it has begun. I was asked to serve on a DMC for an infant pharma company. I think you can all see this now, right? Um, for an infant pharma company, uh, the medical director told us at our first meeting that he can be unmasked at any time. The venture capitalists agree with him. Should I serve on this DMC? Well, here is a chance where you would have uh, the opportunity not to serve. But I think a better thing would be to first at least explain to uh, this company, look, 
the, um, you cannot be unmasked because this trial will not have the credibility that it needs to have uh, if you are unmasked and uh, you know what treatment groups the patients are in. It, the only way is to keep it double blind uh, the whole time. Um, now, what is the masking policy? Well, we use the terms partially masked, meaning like uh, the DMC members only know uh, the treatments as A and B throughout the trial. When they are unmasked, then they know what treatment is A and what treatment is actually B. Uh, now, in reality, our committees are often unmasked from the start uh, because, especially the physician members say, I cannot do my job unless I know what A and B are. Also, if we can't trust the DMC, who can we trust? And thirdly, um, uh, the members are always guessing as to what treatment A and B are through the adverse events uh, that they are reviewing. But what if they guess wrong? That will affect their decision making throughout the trial. Now at our first meeting, we often decide in closed session, we want to be unmasked now. And the DAC statistician then tells us, okay, treatment A is this, treatment B is this. And we don't have to tell, and it is advisable not to tell the sponsor that we have uh, un unmasked. Um, here's a bad start. I am a biostatistician who was asked seven months ago about serving on a DMC for a phase three trial that was about to begin. I called the sponsor several times to reaffirm my interest. Each time I was told that DMC organization was to begin shortly. The sponsor finally sent me a contract yesterday, but I've also learned that the trial began two months ago and dose adjustments have already been made due to early adverse events. Should I join this DMC? Well, here again, you would have the option not to join. But I think you might want to just say, look, um, Perhaps I can help this company by joining and explaining to them, look, this is the, what you've got to do, guys. Uh, you really messed this up. Now, in reality, the DMC is chosen late in the trial organization process because the DMC members cannot be also investigators. So they have to decide who are the investigators because some of the DMC people would be on a short list, uh, the physicians that is, would be on a short list to be investigators. Uh, so, but however, there is no reason that the DMC should be uh, organized after the trial began. Uh, I am a, a DMC chair. The sponsor just sent me and each of the DMC members an email indicating that they are postponing our data review meeting scheduled for three weeks from now. They claim the DAC has not had time to do the programming to prepare for the meeting. We don't want to postpone the meeting and we took a considerable amount of time to get our calendars in order for the scheduled meeting. Do we have to comply with the sponsor's change of date? Uh, well, uh, this is a, obviously in this case they do have to, they have no choice. But there should be no question that only the DMC sets the dates for meetings. The sponsor does not set those dates. And once a trial progresses, the DMC knows what are the issues that have to be decided. The sponsor doesn't know what the issues are. So clearly postpone, they can't uh, postpone a meeting the DMC may feel this date is, cr is critical uh, because of an issue that has already started. Now, with a public company, we had an issue uh, a few years ago where a, a uh, meeting was scheduled and they said, um, we have to change the date for the meeting because the date for your meeting is one week before we enter, we, we have to submit and make public our quarterly corporate report. And if something negative is said by the DMC, we would have to include that in this quarterly report. And uh, the, uh, ph the physician members uh, said, oh, that's okay, we can do that. 
uh, we're here to serve. And this is a dangerous attitude. Some physicians think their only job is to give their expertise, was this an adverse event related to the drug or not, and nothing else. They are forgetting their stewardship responsibility. I, I was a member of this, and I raised the fuss, and I said, no, we have to meet when we're going to meet. They got back to, the sponsor got back to us and said, okay, our management is willing to grandfather this uh, meeting uh, because it was already decided. But in the future, if you tell us a, a date uh, and it conflicts with our quarterly report, we're just going to tell you that date is not good for us. We're not going to tell you it has anything to do with the report. That way, you won't be able to object. Well, this is a, a really bad attitude by a sponsor. Another problem we had, I was on a committee, um, a breast cancer uh, clinical trial, and we had uh, an issue looming. Uh, anyway, um, uh, we were to have our meeting at, at, as a part of the San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference. Uh, and uh, it was scheduled to be on the Sunday, the day before the meeting began, and the sponsor got back to us after that and said, the uh, committee of the San Antonio conference says, there can be no meetings on, on the Sunday. Um, they control all of the meeting rooms, and there can be no meeting. Well, I said, okay, well, we, we still can meet. We can meet off-site. We can even drive to Austin, Texas, if we have to. And the, the committee, the sponsors are, we don't want to get a bad reputation with the San Antonio uh, committee. So what happened? We postponed the meeting for a month, uh, tele made it a telephone conference, postponed it for a month. We had data that, that were not current now because we used the same data that were prepared for the early December meeting. Uh, and we did find an issue. Again, the San Antonio breast cancer co uh, people and the sponsor don't know what issues the committee is facing, and they have no business uh, to tell us when we can and can't meet. And, and another thing that comes from it, there should be no question who is chairing the meetings. I mean, what I see uh, a physician who is chair, sometimes I've been chair, but when I uh, see a physician as chair, and they are just another person in the room, and the sponsor representative is running the meeting and calls on the chair whenever he or she thinks it is appropriate. That is, is a bad message, and that is wrong. The chair should be running the whole meeting, including the open session, because the open session is the open session of the DMC's meeting, and the chair of the DMC should run that uh, as well. Um, I agreed to serve on the DMC for Infant Pharma Company, which has gone public. The drug is a novel approach to pancreatic cancer. The trial is actually a phase two trial, but the regulatory consultant feels that if the results are positive, the regulatory agency will consider it phase three. The sponsor has now told us that we will meet only once at the end of the trial because their board of directors is concerned that if we recommend early trial termination due to a safety concern, they would have to include this information in a press release, and this would have a bad effect on their stock price. I would like to walk away from this DMC, but this is an important drug, and I would like to be associated with its development. What should I do? Uh, well, here again, trial hasn't begun, and um, uh, the, the person could walk away, but on the other hand, uh, the best thing is to educate the company first and, and, and see, tell them that uh, this is ridiculous because uh, there is no stewardship if, if the committee meets only at the end of the trial. At the end of the trial is when uh, the sponsor has unmasked anyway. This is not stewardship and the, and the trial will have more credibility. Uh, if uh, indeed uh, there, uh, the, the committee meets uh, throughout the trial. Uh, now, what is safety monitoring anyway? Um, we want objectives are to protect patients, find dose limiting or trial uh, termination signals, 
separate signal from noise, uh, and separate adverse events from the disease process. And this is where uh, the physician members are very helpful in, in discussing this. Um, so we have these data displays, um, patient enrollment by center, cumulative patient enrollment by month, uh, reason for discontinuation, how current are the data, um, the uh, grade relatedness, and then uh, the same as, not, that should say, it says the same as five, it should say the same as six there. Uh, uh, we created that in later uh, printing. Uh, and laboratory values of interest. Um, now, what are the desirable characteristics for a, a data analysis center? Well, they should have experience already in serving as a DAC. They should have SOPs for DAC operations, DACs for software validation, knowledge of FDA and ICH guidelines for safety monitoring and, and reporting, MEDRA knowledge, library of validated software for report generation, uh, flexible staff for timely response to ad hoc requests, um, off-site computer backup, I mean you can read this, um, statistical staff with a knowledge of clinical trial statistical methods, an interim analysis methodology including conditional power. I mean, right here uh, I'm going to say more about it, but it would be a shame if uh, we said, gee, we've got an issue here, uh, we want to have a conditional power calculation and the DAC statisticians asked us, what is that? Um, uh, so, uh, before the start of the trial, uh, the, the, the DMC at least should discuss statistical methods of the type you see listed here prior to the start of the trial. And the DAC should be prepared to do these kinds of analyses. And if they don't know what they are or they don't have the software, there is time for them now to prepare it. They can't say we didn't warn them that we might ask for some of the things on this uh, trial. Uh, I, I am a biostatistician member of a DMC evaluating an experimental mood disorder drug sponsored by an infant pharma company. I've been working with the DAC biostatistician for six months now and I find that I'm spending a lot of time teaching this person basic statistical methods. The D AC is a CRO, and the biostatistician they have assigned is really more of a computer programmer than a biostatistician. I never expected to have to spend so much time on this, and there is little return on the time that I spend because there are still many misunderstandings due to lack of statistical knowledge. If I don't supervise this person, I don't know who would do so because the sponsor does not have a biostatistical staff. So. What should I do? Quick poll number two, Andrew. That's right. Thank you very much. We certainly do have the second polling question here on audience member screens. And again, you can vote on this in real time by clicking on one of the answers. The question, what should the biostatistician do? Should they resign from this DS DMC, continue to direct this programmer slash biostatistician, or your third option there, this is a sponsor responsibility. Again, you can vote on this in real time by clicking on your screen. What should the biostatistician do? All right, you can get your last votes in now because I'm going to be closing polling and sharing the results with, and with everyone momentarily. And there we have it. 56% of you said that this is a sponsor responsibility. 43% of you said continue to, to direct this programmer slash slash biostatistician, and just 1% of you said resign from the DMC. And with that, Dr. Herzen, I'll send the mic back to you. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. I think uh, the uh, notion of uh, resigning has certainly gotten through to the IDDI nation. Um, and uh, But uh, I, I think that um, uh, the, the third answer is preferable. Uh, to tell the sponsor, look, 
You've got to go out and hire a biostatistical consultant who has this expertise and, and hire them as a contractor. Have that person work with the programmer because it isn't the responsibility. And those who said continue to work have more patience than I have. Uh, and it, it is an option, but I think first uh, it, that should only be done if uh, the, uh, uh, the sponsor does not uh, respond to that suggestion. Um, I am a biostatistical member of a DMC and at our organizational meeting I requested that odds ratios and their confidence interval be computed for all treatment comparisons and safety. We just completed our second data review meeting and the DAC is merely providing p-values for the treatment difference despite my repeated requests. The physician and members of the DMC show no interest in this matter. Should I just be satisfied with what I'm getting, or should I continue to pr press for what I think would be help to me and the DMC? What, what I think, we won't vote on this because we don't have time, but what I think uh, is, I, I have this happen to me, I think that the DAC would have to write a, a, a special program for this, and they don't want to do it, so they're hoping that with the months that pass by that I will have forgotten that I ever asked for this. Uh, and they're waiting to see if I repeat it again, and that is very uh, uh, disconcerting and upsetting to me. Uh, and the biostatistician has to continue to press for what they need just as um, the, uh, the cardiologist on the committee says, I'm not getting the echocardiography reports that I uh, requested. Um, I'm a DMC chair. Our members have been concerned that the sponsor is sending us voluminous tables to review. There are so many pages that present AEs in different ways and with maximum granularity, I'll, I'll uh, define what I mean there, with preferred terms. We are concerned that this information overload might mask true safety concerns. Um, they are right about this. What uh, sponsors often do is they'll just give all of the tables that were prepared for the final uh, NDA uh, submission to the regulatory agencies, which is much more than a DMC needs. And in fact, some of them are using the DMC to find uh, bugs or errors in these reports. At the first meeting, as I said before, the DMC, and, and as the trial progresses, the DMC needs to define the kind of tables that are useful for them for their purpose and that is what must be prepared. Now there are limitations of a safety uh, assessment by a DMC. The DMC is likely to find only AEs that occur immediately and with the highest frequency. They're not likely to find rare or delayed effects. Uh, they may not uh, develop an understanding of chronic effects. And due to stringent eligibility requirements, the clinical trial patients are not representative of those who will be treated with the drug after approval. Different patient types on varying concomitant meds may have a different but, uh, but more common safety experience than the clinical trial patients, and the DMC may miss subtle signals that involve extensive analysis and additional data on surrogates of AEs. So the DMC is not the end all about the safety of this drug. And in fact, um, here is the sensitivity. I won't go into how we calculate this, but the sensitivity to AE detection in a clinical program. On protocol 11 on uh, this, and that's so 26 weeks of therapy, not 26 weeks of follow-up. There are 348 patients on this protocol, and that, such a protocol would have the sensitivity to detect uh, those AEs that occur at a rate of 8.6 per thousand. Now when you add the protocol 12 to this, uh, now we have a total of 754, you see the, that third column there, 754 patients. Cumulatively, we now have the sensitivity to detect four AEs that occur at a rate of four per thousand. And if you go to the last line, we have 2,796 patients. This will detect cumulatively AEs that occur at a rate of 1.1 per thousand. 
So we, this whole trial, this whole program, I mean, will not detect AEs that occur at a rate of a half per thousand or one per 10,000. Um, so safety definitions. Uh, we have to have a dictionary, which is a hierarchy of event types within body system. We, the MEDRA is what is most commonly used. Now the oncologists like to use the CTC. Uh, their uh, the cl uh, um, their uh, clinical trials uh, for cancer, uh, but the, um, uh, there are ways of translating them. Grading is done uh, usually the WHO scale. And CTC has its own scale, but again, uh, we can translate. Now the AE is the adverse event. SAE is the serious adverse event. And I'm going to define these in the next slide. The SUSAR is the suspected, unexpected, serious adverse reaction. And this is a new FDA uh, requirement. I'll just mention that the SUSAR is, uh, I believe I have, let's go to the next, yeah. Uh, it's better to look at it this way. Um, the AE is treatment emergent, an unfavorable, unintended uh, consequence of therapy. The SAE is a death, uh, a life-threatening, or a hospitalization. The hospitalization makes a limitation for us because the SAE has to be regarded as a regulatory, uh, but not, it's not a severity necessarily uh, determination. In some countries, a, a, the investigators are compensated more when a patient is hospitalized than when they're seen only in the clinic. So when they see an adverse event, they hospitalize the patient because they'll get reimbursed by their health systems more for the hospitalization. Uh, but hospitalization, is, by regulation, means this must be an SAE. Some DMCs will say, OK, we want to create our own definition of SAE, taking into consideration that a patient may be hospitalized for a grade one adverse event, but, our, but this, uh, this de designation will be used only for our purposes. The regulatory agencies will still get the SAE the way they want to see it. Now, as I say, the FDA has just required the sponsor to create this SUSAR. This is a sponsor judgment of what is a, um, a, a, a uh, unexpected consequence of therapy that they feel is related. Uh, and uh, we like to see now tabulations of the SUSARs. However, the SUSAR does not come from a case report form. It, uh, uh, and as a result, many DACs cannot yet give tabulations by SUSARs because the sponsor makes that it's part of their own database and not part of the uh, case report form uh, database and we have to have ways of working that out. Um, I am a physician and chair of a DMC for rheumatology indication. We've asked the sponsor for more information from some investigators on SAEs that we've been reviewing. The information has not arrived. How long should we wait before we give up? Well, uh, I, if we voted on this, I think most of you would vote. You should never give up, except there are cases where the sponsor will honestly tell you that uh, we're not going to get any more information on this um, for various reasons. And sometimes the delay is because the um, uh, the uh, uh, the adverse event reports are in a language other than English, and they have to be translated. Um, and uh, and and sometimes they have to uh, get more information from family members, and that is slow in coming. And sometimes it just won't come. Uh, I am a chair of a DMC working on a cardiovascular indication. We've asked the DAC for several ad hoc reports to aid in interpretation of safety concerns. The DAC tells us that they need several weeks for each table because of the need for validation of software and cleaning of the data. We don't feel we can take that much time given that patients are at risk. Can we overrule the need 
for validation and data quality control? The answer is yes, um, because first of all, there should have been some validation, but this is ongoing, and we know that all validation won't be done, including even the classification of AEs until the end of the trial. But we need to make a decision now. Now, I was involved in a recent case where we had a very serious concern. We asked the, uh, the CRO, which was the DAC, please analyze the data in this way. And they told us, well, we have to ask first the sponsor if they will uh, pay for this, which is ridiculous. Six weeks later, they tell us, oh, the sponsor agreed to pay for this. Now, how should we classify the, how should we combine these different adverse events, which was a good question, but why could that not have been asked six weeks ago? We did get the response seven weeks, one week later, seven weeks after we asked for it. This is totally unacceptable. The sponsor should realize they are at risk, the DMC is at risk, and most importantly, the patients are at risk. And uh, I owned a, 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 a long forgotten uh, CRO at one time. And if a question like this came to us and we were the DAC, we would have that answer the next day. Uh, we would have the confidence we'd be paid for that work. And if not, so be it. At least we have the stewardship responsibility of giving this information to the DMC members. Now, in multinational trials, the DMC members should be aware there are geographic, genetic variation, differential diets among countries. This should be taken into account. These things can affect AEs. In some countries, the people are very stoic, and they're not likely to, to self-report uh, AEs, as they are in other countries. Um, and then there are financial incentives to hospitalize patients. Uh, the SAEs, I've already covered that. Um, uh, in some countries, an unmasking is required when an SAE occurs. That's very unfortunate, um, uh, but uh, we have to live with that. Um, and uh, medical surgical, I'll just skip now, a medical surgical practice, the use of supportive care is not the same in each country. Um, and sometimes, uh, let me just skip ahead one, the active control may vary. In an oncology trial, we have active controls, meaning a drug already approved for this oncology indication. But the same active control may not have been approved in all countries. Or maybe the standard of care is, is the active uh, control, and that may vary over countries. Again, um, uh, if, I, if there's di a different control group and I'm looking at odds ratios compared to control, this is going to affect things. The use of supportive care is different. They may not use the same infection control in each country. That has to be looked into and alerted to the sponsor. We think this is an issue. And sometimes surgery uh, is part of the protocol, but a drug is what is being investigated. And the different surgical techniques, the surgical te techniques themselves may cause AEs. Um, I'm a chair of a DMC working on a treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. The trial began five months ago to increase enrollment. The sponsor has added a Canadian site and is considering some Eastern European sites. The Canadian site has told the sponsor that they will not participate unless a Canadian physician is added to the DMC. My fellow DMC members, and I see no need for another member, and we've got a concern that we'll soon be asking to add an Eastern European representative. Isn't this getting out of hand? I think so. Um, I think, um, okay, if they want to add the Canadian representative, I think that they can identify uh, consultants from different regions, which are needed, and as ad hoc consultants as issues come up. And if that region actually enrolls a threshold number of patients, then that consultant could be added to the committee. Um, now, common statistical methods, I just want to say a few things about this. Um, we get the incident rate of these uh, by, by treatment group. Uh, the rate 
per patient, the rate per 100 patient years of follow-up. And then the Poisson, we call the Poisson rate, rate ratio, that is the, the ratio of the rate per 100 patient years between the two groups. Um, Kaplan-Meier, uh, the landmark estimate, um, uh, that is the SAE rate perhaps at 12 months, but determined by the Kaplan-Meier graph and a log, and then uh, the Kaplan-Meier of the time to the first, for each patient, their, the time to their first experience of a certain adverse event by treatment group and a log rank test, although the Kaplan-Meier graph and the log rank test, we would only do that for designated adverse event types that emerge during the trial. Now, people are worried about multiplicity. We're making so many tests. and I don't, uh, so there, well, I'll give my opinion of this, but I can just tell you uh, there is this paper uh, on the, using the false discovery rate for that purpose, and also uh, one of those authors, Mirotra and, and Erdewell, have now a more modern way, a, an improved way of doing the same thing. And there's even a Bayesian uh, approach by Berry and Berry. But my feeling of, of all of this multiplicity stuff is all it means is we might over-report. But at least uh, if, I, if I were to use the p-value, let's say a, a 0 0.10, if I were to use that to determine what, uh, what adverse event type should I call to the attention of the physicians, I can't over-report because I'll tell it to them and I'll say, oh, Jay, that's not a problem, that's part of the disease process. Jay, we expect that, uh, and this is not serious. Fine, but, we sh but at least we're addressing it. I, it's not like an efficacy endpoint. Also, there will, be, uh, there will be adverse events that are not statistically significant that the physician members say, hey, this is important. We may have three cases of renal failure in one group, and one in the control group is not statistically significant, but the physician members are very concerned with this. Um, so uh, one uh, bias in pitfalls now, granularity is an, a, a compulsive uh, tendency to add many disease categories within an organ system. The more categories, the more granularity. So here we see uh, eye disorders. You see a lot of uh, small numbers there for the individual preferred terms. Uh, that's because there are so many groups. Well, what do we do about this? 440 patients in each arm. There is a statistically significant difference overall. What do we do with this? Well, we might group them. Well, one ophthalmologist tells me, let's group by inflammation type. So there are four inflammation types represented by these adverse event numbers uh, uh, on the previous page. And uh, it's only the last one that is statistically significant. Well, this is more information. This is useful. But another ophthalmologist says, well, let's group by the types of tissue involved. And now we see the third group uh, is the one uh, that, that whatever that tissue type is, this is more information, and this is useful, but not every uh, committee does this. So, um, uh, but we should consider that a sponsor strategy, sufficient granularity, can keep SAEs off of the label. Congestive heart failure might be uh, classified under any of these three categories. Small numbers, not statistically significant the SAE doesn't get on the label. Acute stroke can be classified under several preferred terms under several organ systems. So what do we do? Well, we now have, and this has arisen only in the last two years, query templates, SMQs, standardized measure queries. Medra organization is creating, using physician panels, templates for certain diseases. They are combining um, um, the S a preferred terms and all of this in a good way so that to avoid the problems I have just described. But they've done it only so far for certain diseases. 
uh, some sponsors have made proprietary queries. We, I call that ad hoc preferred terms. This is created by the sponsor in the same spirit of the SMQs. And industry committees are working on templates, perhaps the CDIS committee is, I don't know which committee it is, but they are also working on this to be used by the, uh, by the entire um, uh, industry uh, community. Um, now, there are uh, biases, investigator knowledge of treatment assignment, over-reporting for the experimental and under-reporting for the active control. Um, this happens as a result of, uh, I, I talked about the geographic problems before, um, serafinib uh, is well known in North America. It, it is an oncology drug and it causes severe diarrhea. And um, in, however, uh, perhaps we're now using that drug in Eastern Europe, where it is approved, but it's very expensive. But uh, the sponsors, but the investigators are very happy, but the investigators don't have the experience that their North American counterparts have. So whenever there's a case of diarrhea, they do the right thing. They report it as an AE. In North America, the, the investigators say, well, everyone knows that serafinib causes um, a severe diarrhea. I don't have to report this. It's transient. We know how to handle it. And um, um, the, um, I have enough forms to fill out. I have enough paperwork to fill out. I, I, I'm not going to do it. So you get under-reporting uh, in one group, over-reporting in another. Incomplete follow-up by the sponsor uh, uh, can cause a bias. Um, now here, I, I don't want to go through the statistics of computing risk, but I just want to show you. Um, in oncology, in other diseases too, but in oncology, we have add-on trials where treatment A is the active control, B is the experimental treatment. So we have, uh, we're testing A plus B versus A. And, but look at what we have. We, we have uh, on treatment A, 175 patient years of, uh, of ex exposure. Treatment A plus B, 85 patient years of exposure. Now, if I just look at the incidence of cardiac, cardiac SAEs, 5.3% on treatment A, only 0.67%. Odds ratio shows statistical significance, the official's exact test, statistical significance. But now I look at the number of SAEs per 100 patient years, 4.57 on A, 1.18 on A plus B, a, a relative risk of, um, or rate ratio of 3.89, the confidence interval is very wide. And the reason for this difference is there's less follow-up on A plus B. One reason, a likely reason, that on A plus B we're not seeing the cardiac adverse events is because the patients aren't treated. They die uh, with the addition of treatment B. They go off study because of something else treatment B is causing, so they don't have the exposure yet to develop the cardiac SAEs. This is why I feel patient years should be on every table and always considered uh, in analysis. Now, DMC decisions, uh, well, we decide on efficacy at an interim analysis when specified, but um, safety is continuous and in the absence of knowledge of efficacy. As I say, there's art as well as science involved. Now, if we see a, a, a SAE of concern, we can do an unmasking, if we haven't already. Um, send out, tell a sponsor, send out a Dear Investigator letter to um, alert them to this. Modify the informed consent, uh, a protocol modification, maybe a dose reduction, or just terminate the trial. And again, how we arrive on that is after much deliberation. Uh, if it, the informed consent is to be changed, then the question comes, do we have to reconsent those already on the trial or only those coming into the trial? I don't think there's any question. Why should those uh, just enrolling now have more information than those who have already 
that enrolled. Um, DMCs uh, and uh, marketing advice. I am a physician member of a DMC for a randomized active control in, in seasonal allergic rhinitis. The active control is a marketed drug for this indication, which it should be. The tables we review show there's a consistent 18% incidence of transient headache, which we can confidently attribute to the experimental drug, because we know that this does not occur at all in the active control. I'm in favor of terminating the trial, because I am confident that no physician is going to prescribe a drug with this side effect. My fellow DMC members think such an extreme action would be out of line. What should we do? Well, um, I think that, uh, in, in fact, it would be out of line. The DMC is not there to make marketing decisions, even when they would really like to do that. It's only the safety, and if they feel, as I think they do, a transient headache, it's not severe, don't terminate the trial, that is fine. Now, when the trial is over, they can give the, the marketing uh, advice if uh, they want to. Um, I'm sitting on a DMC where there is, the accrual is very slow and not likely to ever reach the sample size to establish efficacy that appears in the protocol. Can the DMC terminate the trial on the basis that patients are being exposed to a drug we are not likely to ever learn about its efficacy? The answer is um, uh, uh, no, not right away. The answer is to give advice, say, hey, look, we want you to enroll more centers. Uh, we want you to talk to this investigator or that investigator. They are enrolling patients. What techniques are they using? Give that kind of advice. Now, in adaptive designs, I'll try to go through this quickly. Um, there are some uh, where we drop a dose or a treatment group uh, in the middle of a trial. The danger we face on DMCs here is the dose or the treatment group, if there is, let's say, three treatment groups and the control, the treatment group that is being dropped is the only one that had a safety, uh, efficacy, a safety, a, a, an acceptable safety protocol. We have to open our mouth on that. Uh, same for adaptive assignment to treatment group. Uh, if, if the experimental treatment has uh, more uh, of a safety issue, we don't want more patients uh, to be uh, assigned to that. Uh, changing objectives would be a similar. Um, changing the, the last one is the CHW, what has become known as the CHW method uh, of um, sample size reestimation. Uh, at the interim analysis in this type of design, in the interim analysis, uh, the patient, they, they find whatever the effect size is, at the interim analysis, an algorithm determines what sample size is required to find this effect size statistically significant. Now, at the beginning of the trial, the clinical, um, clinically uh, significant effect size is agreed to by all. Now we have, uh, at, at interim analysis, we're seeing a smaller uh, uh, effect size than what was considered clinically significant. Um, now the sample size will be increased. The statistical member has to inform the physician members of what is going on here and has to ask them, the safety profile that we're seeing, you could live with, live with that if the clinical um, significant effect size uh, emerged. Can you live with it if, the, uh, if we have less than the clinically uh, significant effect size being statistically significant. Physicians usually don't understand what is going on in the CHW design, and the statistician must uh, inform them of that. Um, how do we train DMC members is certainly important. Uh, we don't have a solution to that yet. Um, statisticians are concerned with this. Uh, physicians feel that uh, because of their knowledge of medicine, they don't need any training to become a DMC member. What about cost control? I believe uh, the chair should have a budget, uh, a slush fund, uh, to cover the ad hoc 
uh, um, analyses that may be needed without telling the sponsor. I think it was ridiculous in the case I described before when the CRO goes to the sponsor and says, I need, I need permission to do this ad hoc analysis. They're sending a message to the sponsor that there's a safety concern and we don't want that to be happening. DMCs can be audited um, and uh, if they are, somebody had better have a backup of uh, the minutes of the closed sessions. Uh, when there's mergers and licensing, what happens to the DMC uh, uh, when the sponsor is merging with another sponsor? Who is in, in, in charge the, at, 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 when the drug is licensed to another committee? The, the uh, DMC is often left in a hiatus, and when there's a merger, the uh, sponsor team may be looking for new jobs because of the merger. Maybe they've already been laid off, but the DMC remains and they still have the stewardship until they are told otherwise. The future, big data and big medicine. Uh, electronic medical records are here to stay. The merger of healthcare delivery and clinical research. In the future, uh, because of electronic medical direct records, a patient comes into the clinic, they have a certain disease, immediately comes up on the screen, what clinical trials uh, is this particular patient uh, uh, eligible for? And if there is one and the patient consents, poof, that clinician is an investigator on this trial. Um, companion diagnostics is a big thing now in oncology. Uh, very often the companion diagnostic has not yet been approved as a diagnostic and the, the DMC has to determine uh, is this, uh, in, compared to a gold standard, is the sensitivity and specificity of this companion diagnostic sufficient to make the requirement for the targeted therapy that is being used on this oncology trial. Um, we now have risk-based monitoring and threat detection by algorithm. No longer are we going to be sending the CRAs to the sites to review every single case report form. We're doing it centrally by algorithm, by software that different companies are, are licensing for this purpose. Should the DMC receive information on uh, which centers are doing a good job and a bad job uh, as far as errors and which centers are candidates for fraud. I don't have an answer to it, but it is the future uh, that DMCs will get involved in. And we're going to be getting safety data arriving in real time from sensors and nanoparticles, huge amounts of big data, and what are we going to do with this, who gets it first, um, and, do, and when does the DMC get it? DMCs in the future will exist but be very busy. Uh, they not be practical for a person to be a member of more than one committee as they are today, including myself. And we may have meta-monitoring committees, committees that um, are looking at adverse events that come from an entire class of drugs. And, they, and these meta-monitoring committees may be employed by insurance companies, third parties, not necessarily the sponsor. And the DMCs that are working in post-market uh, may not be reporting to sponsors, but to big data, big medicine, and health insurance consortia, because they are certainly stakeholders uh, in, in, with these issues. Well, here is the time for me to thank you. I know we've taken longer than I wanted. I hope you're still on the line. And I will ask uh, Andrew now uh, to read any questions uh, he has uh, received or is in currently receiving. Andrew, are you still there? I am there. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Herson. That was a very, very useful presentation for everyone. Uh, like you said, we have run several minutes over time today and unfortunately won't be able to address any of the audience members' questions live today uh, for the Q&A portion of the webinar. But the team at IDDI will attempt to answer your questions sent in already uh, via email. 
If you do have any further questions, you can please direct them to the email address showing on your screen right now. That's for Dominique Grissard at dominique.grissard at idDI.com. And I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's conference. You'll be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. And a survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us improve our further webinars. Now, please join us in thanking our speaker via email uh, using Twitter at IDDI underscore official. That's Dr. Jay Herson. We hope that you found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.